<laughs> What's up, my brother? Uh, <laughs> Hello, hello. So this is Little Gay Guide, and I'm going to be interviewing and interviewed by James Gerard, which is one of my nearest and dearest friends slash family, and many, many other adjectives that are not necessarily needed for now. Uh, <laughs> without further ado, uh, James, please introduce yes. yourself. Hi. Hi, my bestie. My name is James. I've known you just at the six-year mark. Mm -hmm. And let's see, what about me? I am this profoundly human person. I am flawed. I'm imperfect. I have had like this constant evolving journey through my life that's taken me through a wide variety of experiences. I'm an out gay man who has been out in and out of officially somewhere between 19 and 22 in the ever ever evolving coming out process uh it was actually kind of a slow slow burn i was a, a slow evolver in that um what are you doing nowadays i am a therapeutic and rehabilitative body worker also known as a massage therapist but i prefer body work uh for work uh in that it encompasses obviously the physical aspects of what's going on but also often the emotional and mental and spiritual aspects that can also be sort of held and that can also emerge which to me sort of taps into everything that i want to be doing in my life nice so let's start right off the bat with a really really big yeah, since we're there yes <laughs> since we're there uh uh what do you think of the fall of our society the rise of automation multinational corporations, late stage capitalism, in tandem with climate change, climate refugees, social economic gap and racial injustices. I'm totally kidding. All of us, so, so my, honestly, my actual answer to that is looking at the history and the arc of where we are, how could it be otherwise? We have, we have painted ourselves into the, God, we're fucked corner. Do we want to start painting in a different direction? So, going into that different direction <laughs> yeah. and of course we will not be able to cover no. even one of those topics no, uh, let's start from the beginning because yeah. the way i know you and the way you and i deconstruct things is often actually starts from a very simple question which is growth what do growth and grief have in common oh good lord um growth and grief this is i mean and it's funny you you we we, we we touched on this last night as sort of a, here's, here's where we're going to start. And I'm still trying to articulate. First of all, I think growth is something that we're constantly called to do. We, we, we think of growing up as something that happens from the ages of birth to about 18. And, and then somehow uh, there's this sort of cultural narrative that our, our, maybe our physical growth has mostly stopped, but even that isn't necessarily true. Much of that early stage growth happens there. I think it's something that we can, if we choose to and, and we align with it, it's something that we get to do physically, mentally, emotionally, and as I said, spiritually throughout our lives. Coming back to that same cultural imperative, I think we have at least in, in, in American culture, and, and you can probably speak to it from, the, from a different perspective coming from Israeli culture and, and Jewish culture, which is actually where I've learned a lot of my perspective is tapping into that community. We're really, really, really rough, at least in our, in our culture, in our, our country, about what we'll call, I don't like calling them negative emotions because all of the emotions are valid, but sort of the lower vibrational heavy stuff. Um, mm -hmm. anger, sadness, grief, um, fear. We don't like them because they don't necessarily feel good. And so we don't do them very well. And so they get to be places that we're particularly stuck. And I think what a lot of, what I see a lot in my practice is places where the sadness and the confusion and that overwhelmingness of, of a specific grief place ends up being shoved under the corner because we don't have the tools to manage it. And so then it just continues to sit there and fester and it inhibits our ability to further grow. For me, when I look at grief and growth, I think of any, in any process of progression, in any process in which you are 
intrinsically better than you were before, there is also the process of shedding or letting go of something you either killed, grown over, or evolved to, which is that, that the link between those two for me is one begets the other. You have to let go of something to be better. You have to let go uh, of something in order to become a more humane version of yourself. Yes. Whenever I look at you when it comes to your practice, which by the way, for those who don't know, you are hands down one of the best body worker that I've ever met in my life from personal experience. Uh, and I am a tough client. <laughs> <laughs> I would not say so, but that's fine. <laughs> well, it depends on the time of the year, you know, are, are we, fair, are we, fair. are we gay summer buddy ready? Or are we just, <laughs> are we just pudgy? <laughs> Is it's this how, October? How abusive have you been? <laughs> <laughs> it, it really depends on muscle density. That being said, you are <laughs> hands down you. one of the best, but, but at the same Thank time, you. there's a lot of your, other practices that have boiled over and sift into mm -hmm. my own life, which is your grief counseling and mm -hmm. your holistic approach to body work, which does include, unfortunately, in American society, not often, but with you absolutely does, uh, the idea of healing the mind, healing the spirit, healing the heart, mm -hmm. and the body is just a factor of that. A riff on that, the interesting, my particular introduction to work with grief, and you're talking about grief and growth, was a, a particular program after a, a significant loss in my life called Grief and Growing. And it is exactly that. It is that part of understanding that growing and changing has two parts. And we actually just talked about this recently, about there's, yes, the, the, the vine that you're reaching to to swing to, but there's also the vine that you have to let go behind you because otherwise you're just kind of stuck and hanging there. I don't know if you can see my arms, but you're like, yeah. So there's the, also this piece and we're very reluctant to let go of that vine behind us because of what it offered us. And understanding that the vine behind us used to be the vine in front of us, you know, but it's it's been safety and stability and security and those relationships that we've had, the, the, the life that we had, whether it's the, the loss of a person, the loss of a job, simply a change in circumstances, the, the who mm -hmm. I used to be, there is some shedding of that and letting go of that piece so that you can move forward into the new place of who I'm going to be, you know, a constant shedding of a piece of who I was. One of the things I run into is a deep reluctance to let go, but I like <laughs> the skin, you know, the skin really served me. I, I don't want to let it go. And, and so there's that, that disparity of- There will never I mean, be comfort in growth. There will never be no, comfort no. in brushing against one's own boundary. And, exactly. and I think we delude ourselves or at least seek comfort in the vine you're describing behind us. Uh, right. the, the, this idea of, but I know it so well. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's the vine that I know even if I'm done with it. You know, it might be crumbling and ready to let me go, but- And it will tear up your arm. Yeah, exactly. it will tear up your arm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also inhibiting your ability to swing to the next vine, of the leap into the unknown. I think one of the things that we forget is that we forget the pieces that's going along with this, which is that intrinsic self. Like me as a whole person, yes, there may be pieces that I'm letting go of, but you know, we're moving, but it's still moving forward. It's still, oh, you know, I have to take this tangent because you just basically sure, dangled a, a, a high hanging fruit, but the fruit nonetheless <laughs> uh, is two people who've been broken down quite a few times. Now I am leading the witness and I apologize in advance. <laughs> Uh, I, I, but, but, but in many ways, you and I share the conception that every such breaking event, every such moment, uh, when you are shattered on the ground with your shards mm -hmm. and your soul and your pieces, mm -hmm. there is that intrinsic moment of I am me, the kernel that will not shake in face of any doubt, in face of any shift, mm -hmm. in face of any growth. And when you pick the pieces, the ones that are addicted to growth, which will be a whole other topic later if we get to it but what right. you do get to choose and in the act of choosing there is to combine both metaphors and analogies there is this swinging forward and probably lighter than you were before but with much larger larger challenges right well uh, uh, 
you know, I, I like the, the visual of like sort of shattering, you, you know, your heart shattering, your soul shattering and picking up the pieces that still like matter, the, the ones that still resonate, the ones that still work and need to move forward. Those are the pieces of you that are going, but looking at the ones and saying, actually, this doesn't apply to me anymore. Or this doesn't actually serve me in any way and being able to leave it behind. Um, one, of, one of my favorite sayings that, that I have frequently, I'm sure I've used it with you as well in this work is that there is absolutely no difference between your heart shattering or your heart breaking and your heart breaking open. And, and that to me always, oh, that's right, you know, yeah. I don't want this to be armored. I need it to be soft. And I reflect with my own experience and say the following, you don't get a bigger heart without a wound. You don't oh, get absolutely. a larger understanding of empathy, sympathy, mm -hmm. or just humanity if you don't get the blood, if you don't get the cuts, if you don't get yeah. the broken or shattered pieces. Uh, absolutely. To be, to be allowed a deeper perspective is to be allowed and in many ways invite a lot of pain. Oh God, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's to, to, to swing back to your, are we working on the summer body thing? You know, we all, we all understand lifting those weights is hard and it's heavy and it hurts. And then it hurts like hell the next couple of days. And what it is is you are, you're, you're, you're tearing the muscles apart, you're straining them, you're stressing them, you're, you're ripping them in very small ways to shreds so that they come back together stronger, bigger, and more capable. What and, does it say to our culture that we are so adamantly and intuitively reflect on the physicality of things? And I will not correlate, even though my mind is screaming, to correlate monetary value and uh -huh. external uh, values versus eternal values uh, with this idea that I'm about to present, which is why do we get that muscles growing is such a uh, strenuous, painful exercise for growth, which, which in which we see the results, but yet on any other element in life or any other avenue in life, we are so stunted and we are. Yeah. I mean, you know, to, to, to bring back your early joke about late stage capitalism, we can monetize the physical. You know, how are you going to monetize somebody's feelings? Oh, you know, I would how, say that and, easily. Out of end subscriptions are, pres sorry, out of end prescriptions are 370% or something along well, those lines. Yeah. Social media, has, oh, the God. reason that it's actually taking off the way it does is it literally manipulates and, and shifts and adjusts an understanding of us as this relatively intangible piece beyond our physicality, but how do I feel about all of these things? So yeah. that's actually, to, to, to do that structure, that's actually it, is we haven't up until recently been able to look at essentially sort of taking these things that we've, we've viewed as relatively intangible, like our thoughts and our feelings, and actually understood that even though they feel somewhat intangible, they actually have weight and they have value and that they're real. Um, they're not just a fleeting thing. They can actually be some of the most powerful motivating forces in our universe. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, and, and the moment of reckoning for most people is not only unavoidable, but inevitable. There's no absolutely. way that you get through uh, any kind of meaningful relationship with anything, be it a person, a place, or even an object. Uh, without recognizing that the external value is is not remotely uh, the tip of the iceberg, mm -hmm. there is there is Absolutely. so much more there to that relationship. Exactly, or even you know the understanding between like witnessing how a, a relationship changes, you know, especially I mean you know to, to 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 look at a romantic relationship where the initial push and pull is almost invariably that physical attraction and that very sometimes sexual, sometimes just simply a, a, a dynamism that is created. And that doesn't necessarily need to go away, but the weight of the emotional and historical and you know, connection that continues to grow and bond, sometimes 20 years down the road, you're like, you know, my partner, my husband, my wife, you know, I'm still attracted to them, but the attraction is so much more here as opposed to here, you know, and, and how much more weight 
those things have, but it's a, it's a slower grow, if you will. Live in a world in which the highlight reel of everybody else's life is not only enhanced, but is meticulously crafted to make you contrast and compare with yourself on a constant right. basis, be it a notification or a post. And there's this right. incessant fight uh, internally and externally that, that forces you into a dialogue of what is the actual value of things? What is the actual value of things to you? And what do you do? I, tangent, important one. Time is finite. Time is finite. I, I, yes. think, I think one of the biggest sins of the American society outside of racial injustice, which, which is its own topic. And so BIPOC people aside, which is basically saying the original sin of this country aside, mm -hmm. let's talk about another one, which is the late stage capitalism, which does not value time, be it the no. only finite resource we have in our life. The only finite resource yeah. we have in our life is, is the second that we just lost the second that we're just given away to, to the annals of time. And I have a problem with that. I have a problem with the devaluing of that. It's, it's, it's our single, it's, you know, we, we all, we're, we're looking at what we're referring to as sort of limited or non-replenishable resources versus ones that are at least relatively replenishable. You know, obviously the sun will eventually burn out, but certainly not in our lifetimes. You're right, the single most valuable one that we have is time and specifically our time here in earth, our time with our loved ones and strangers, and how am I maximizing the value of that time? We've sort of created this culture that actually entraps us into devaluing it and frittering it away and missing time, which if I may, you may. if I can circle this back around, that is actually one of the deep lessons and gifts of grief. Huh is that it's in in those moments of grief you are suddenly deeply aware of certainly uh, in retrospective all of the all of the times and moments and places you have the you have the opportunity to see here's where i didn't use the time that we had whether it's with a parent who has just died or a partner who has left or whatever it is that you're you're grieving whatever those losses are it is that opportunity to look and say did I, did I, did I put myself fully in it? Did I, did I value every moment that I was there or did I walk through it assuming there were always going to be further moments? Hmm. Tough one. And uh, exactly. And, and it gives you the opportunity to sort of check yourself and say, how present was I really there? Was that fight that I was in with my mom for three years where we didn't speak to each other? How does that feel now? You had one of those two. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what gay man hasn't? <laughs> I'm learning something new every day. Uh, I did too. <laughs> Sweetie, guilty yeah. as charged. I mean, it wasn't like completely not speaking to each other, but the minute she started breaking, bringing up anything that was like, what we'll call off topic of the fact that of accepting that I was gay. It was like, okay, gotta go by. Yes. I, I, um, I, 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 I my, my yes. okay, gotta go by was more, here's a duffel bag, get the F out. Right. Uh, exactly. Which was unfortunate, but right. it is what it is. Right. Uh, well, and there are those places where in terms of actually coming to, and I'm not saying that those always get devalued, looking back at that time with my mom then, you know, my mom is now 78 years old and or 70. Yeah, 78 years old and, and, you know, certainly, and we're in the time of COVID. And so, you know, that's a, a little more perilous. I look back at those time and I'm like, would I change anything? Absolutely not. Because now we actually have the relationship that we have. But I've also witnessed people who've had the, the he said, she said this thing and it pissed me off and you didn't mm -hmm. lean into that, that, that questioning. You just slammed down the phone and said, I'm never speaking to you again. There was no real purpose to it. And then in hindsight, you're like, God, I wish. Pick that thread just a bit. You don't get to keep a relationship if you don't do this specific thing. If you don't no. break the China, if you don't uh, hurt the person, you just don't get to have that long-term. The reality is, at least for me, and please chime in, you don't get to be a close person to another person or bring them into your fold what I call chosen family, 
mm-hmm. without significantly hurting them and then significantly hurting you because that's the only way I've seen us learning. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, the only thing that I would change in that is not so much, is, is maybe the languaging of not your goal, it, it, like understanding that that will in fact happen because we're human. Not that like you do it in order to strengthen the relationship. I will say it differently. The yeah, closer yeah. you are to the person, the sharper and longer your knife becomes. And even Absolutely. if your intention is not there to cut the other person that's now close, your efficacy at, at hurting them, your efficacy and the capabilities Absolutely. of hurting them is, is, is in tandem to your closeness. You yes. hurt those Absolutely. who are closest to you. So to yes. align both of our perspectives, I agree, it's not a benchmark or, right. or a prequisite. It's not uh, a goal. <laughs> it's not a goal. <laughs> Ron, I'm is, pulling out my knife and sharpening it now. <laughs> but I will, I, will, I will argue, I will at least push back that it's also inevitable. It's Absolutely. never a goal. It's also right. inevitable. Right. Which to that point, actually, I think this is maybe the piece that I felt was missing, is the relationships deepen and, and those, those, those relationships that we will say, ah, you are now in the inner circle, you're, you're in, basically, you're, you're, you're brother material, is not so much whether or not we hurt each other, it's what we do with it afterwards. Which is exactly where most things to bring us full circle to our initial question, that's mm-hmm. where growth and grief merge. It's Absolutely. the stepping up. It's not what we've lost. It's what we've done with said loss. Exactly. Absolutely. It's, it's, here is the reality that's in front of me. What am I going to do with it? Tangential conversation that we may want to have at some point about both serenity and forgiveness, which I have an entire <laughs> spiel on because it isn't what most people think it is, or at least it's, it's more complicated than that. Yes, there's hurt here. Do I want to sit in the hurt? Do I want to sit in this pain and carry it with me like it's something precious? Build that wall between that person that could have been your best friend. Or do I want to speak into it? Have at least the possibility of setting it down because the other person looks and says, oh my God, I hurt you. I'm so sorry. I want to internalize the word sorry. And I think I want to, I want to combine two things. The word sorry for Americans seems to be like a binary zero and one uh, or or a switch of sorts for for most Americans. The sorry is lip service. And by the way, all tough conversations, societal and or otherwise start with lip service. We don't get a different starting point. We get to start from the thickness of it. Uh, but, But to combine the sorry and process of grief, I find that if I really want to do something, if I really want to appreciate a person, and I'm going on a tangent, um, if I really want to have you with me, I need to accept two things. A, we will get through this, and B, we're aiming towards the same goal, which is yes. to get through the, through this. What do you want to say to, to whoever might be watching? And I know that grief and growth cannot be summarized in any yeah. 20, 30, 40 minutes worth of conversation but what would be your truisms led to this tangent which is the idea of apology and we're, we're taught you know the i'm sorry is the apology when it's in fact a lot more complicated than that i i would say with all of those pieces i think the thing that sort of threads through them for me is looking okay this is this is what's in my hand this is the pile that's in front of me whether it's a shit pile or a pile of broken glass or whatever my reality is with it what's more important to me but more how do I genuinely care for myself what's my goal and what's most important what do I what can I let go of that I don't need what serves me you know as a guiding principle I think that's certainly got me pretty far and I've failed epically multiple times on that principle <laughs> but that's girl not, you know, but, but, <laughs> but that would be the process of growth that we're talking about you know one of my one of my very beloved old managers once told me because you know i have a lot of knowledge and much like you this is one of the ways we bond i can argue on anything mm-hmm. um 
you know, and, and I have a perspective and I'm, I'm, I'm strongly opinionated. And he, he looked at me at one point and he's like, you know, you really like being right. Hmm. My question is, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? And I'm like, well, I'm happy when I'm right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, on, on, on that point, just because I, I have a, a very visceral response, Yes, I like to be right. I'm even happy to be right. Mm -hmm. But there is an element of being wrong that when you get to that position of mutual understanding of mm -hmm. wrong, and I am proven wrong, which to any person who knows me knows that's a monumental mountain to both <laughs> conquer, traverse, or even approach. But mm -hmm. when you do, and you have many times, you specifically, mm -hmm. I, I feel rewarded. I, when I say I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Those two statements for me are acknowledgement of a shedding of a bias or broadening of a perspective exactly. or a learning of a new truth or broader truism. There's a massive unadulterated gift in, in accepting that. Absolutely. I think there's also you know, just to sort of even expand it, and this is, you know, maybe, maybe jumping ahead along in the growth curve, um, but there's also a place beyond now an understanding of the very limited binary of right and wrong is what's actually serving you here. Like, is it being right or is actually discovering what genuine truth is? So, so often that we believe that our opinions or our beliefs need to be defended in this right and wrong binary. If, if, if my belief is wrong, then something about me is wrong or bad. And instead saying, what if, what if it isn't that it's wrong, it's just incomplete? Or what incompatible. Or incompatible. Exactly. For so it's, many moments in life, you're stuck in this place of, I can make this right. And the, sometimes the simplest, most elegant answer is, no, you don't. Right. No, boil down to time, being finite. Exactly. exactly. You know, there, there are a bunch of different visuals, but it's you know, the old allegory of you know, the three blind men touching the elephant. And, and well, it's a tree because he's at the leg mm -hmm. and it's a snake because he's at the trunk. And it's, no, it's a, it's a, it's a branch because you know, he's at the tail. And mm -hmm. they're all right from their perspective and they've completely missed the, the entire picture. And that is exactly why we're having this conversation because exactly. we are blind people going through this mm -hmm. reality and what I'm hoping to do over time is to bring the pieces together and show maybe at least an outline of an elephant to all of us. So, so that's which, actually a really, which, really fun. With, you know, coming back to both growth and grief, our grief is a really individual experience, but it's also mm -hmm. a communal experience. And, and we actually, there are pieces of our grief that we need to heal ourselves because we're the only ones that are experiencing that particular loss. Even like, say someone dies, everyone is grieving the loss of that person, but they're really grieving the loss of their relationship with that person. Absolutely. At the same time, we do our best grief when we actually come together. And when we share our stories and we say, here is my, here is, here is my touching the leg of that elephant of that relationship with this <laughs> person. And the other person's like, really? Because I was up at the trunk. And then there's somebody else who was grabbing hold of the ears and only in those communal and, and, and collective experiences do we actually get a fuller idea. And that actually helps us heal with our grief and let go of, you know, that, 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 that pain that we associate I with I do feel there is a mosaic of sorts that humanity has been painting since its inception. Mm -hmm. And if we divorce ourselves from our own very, very sharp, very pointy and very heavy hubris, of our own perspective in our own life and our own timeline, uh, you do see or start to see um, some aspects of truths, human truths, humane truths that, that, that carried through the ages, that carried through the generations. And now I know it will be a topic for a second conversation, not for this one, uh -huh. uh, but, but in piecing this elephant together as a humanity, as our joint humanity, you know, the world is my country, mankind is my brethren, to do kindness mm. is my religion, um, the great Thomas Paine. But, but, but back to the yeah. elephant, if we're to paint this together, I'm really 
tantalized by the notion of I made I met a very kindred spirit in you, and and in many ways I feel we we bear a certain responsibility a to describe it and b to share it uh, and most importantly to to our own experience because I'm sorry I'm going to be very adamant about humankind needs and should accept the fact that selfish is first everything else is second but that is i know it's a provocative thing for you to even acknowledge it, it depends on what how you define selfish <laughs> exactly. But yeah, exactly but you know my yeah. idea for yeah, us course, to be absolutely. a community of better people i want all of the people around me to be happy therefore that is for me <laughs> that is for my needs <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly is, i need people to be better i need people to be happier 